we wanted to try and build a Bitcoin model. Bitcoiners have their own style of language, their own sort of model of the world, the way we understand stuff. And there's a large corpus of information out there around it from Bitcoin and praxeology to Bitcoin and mushrooms, to Bitcoin and yoga, to Bitcoin and death metal, you name it, whatever, right? It's all out there. And I think that's broad enough for you to be able to um, build a Bitcoin language model. This is not something that knows anything. It's just something that reflects like aggregate of what the Bitcoin paradigm thinks. Welcome back to the Freedom Footprint Show with Knut Svanholm and me, Luke the Pseudofin. And today's guest is our friend Alex Fetsky. You might know him as the co-author of the Uncommunist Manifesto. He's also the founder of the Bitcoin Times magazine, and he's got a really interesting project, the Spirit of Satoshi AI project. So, Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you, man. I thought I thought you were about to say Spirit of Satan, the way you pronounce Satoshi there for a second. <laughs> like, That's the death metal AI. Uh, Luke is working on that, I think. You got it, dude. Sorry, it's in the tongue. Alexander the Great, welcome. Yeah, the, we'll unpack some stuff about the spirit of Satoshi first. So, and you told me a bunch about how this works in Prague and some misconceptions about AI in general. I really mm-hmm. love the term you, I think you coined the midwit obsolescence technology instead of you. artificial intelligence. So, um, in your mind, why, why is an AI not intelligent? Big question. I, I think, first of all, it's very hard to define intelligence. And from what I at least understand, intelligence seems to have something to do with agency. I mean, at the very least, consciousness, I think, is very much uh, got something to do with intelligence. Sorry, consciousness has something very much to do with agency. And general intelligence, at least the human flavor of it, definitely has something to do with agency. And, And I think if we had to separate out machine, quote unquote, intelligence, um, versus the, the human kind, uh, or the, uh, the alive kind or the sentient kind or the conscious kind. Um, I think that's probably the, the central factor, but beyond just that is the fact that, yeah, intelligence is just a tricky, it's a tricky thing to define. Like different people define it different ways, you know, and you have different types of intelligences. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that a tree is much more intelligent at transforming, you know, sunlight into photosynthesis and growing, you know, branches and leaves and wood than we are, right? Um, or that a computer is. So, so like there's, there's so many varied, uh, definitions or domains or contexts for intelligence that, um, you know, I guess you could argue that machines are intelligent in their specific domain. Like obviously a tree can't do what a computer can do. But these things are ultimately fundamentally directed by us. So I think they're more like tools than they are uh, what people conceptualize as intelligent beings or intelligent agents or intelligent so something you know with with more substance than um than what a computer essentially is. All right. Uh, so so what what is an AI and what what does it do then? Uh, and how, how do you program one? How and how how did you get the idea to? Uh... To, to build your own and why? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. Five questions. Let me, let me start with the first one. Uh, you know, what, what are these things? Um, I think a, a better definition for, you know, these, these programs essentially is they're probability machines. Fundamentally, they, you know, you, you train them. Even the word train is a little bit, uh, misleading, but you, you train them. You, you use the, basically the law of large numbers to recognize patterns. Um, And what we find that is much of the world, uh, much of the things around us have patterns. The problem is that, you know, patterns are infinitely fractal, you know, up and down the spectrum. So you'll never be able to, you know, I believe build something that can analyze all the patterns, right? Um, And, you know, human beings are a unique example of something that is good at both like we're good at recognizing patterns across a broad, 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 broad range of things. Um, but we also, you know, combine that with some sort of thumos or some sort of like internal drive towards something. Like, you know, we, we, we have a direction, and, you know, an agency as we were discussing earlier. Like we, we have a desire to go somewhere, but to come back to these machines. Like we have found patterns, not only in mathematics, you know, more recently, obviously with the language models, we found that language is very pattern driven. And if we can analyze the patterns, if we can associate numbers or vectors 
to words and sentences and things like that, we've been able to build machines which can basically vomit out strings of sentences, words, paragraphs, whatever, that seemingly represent something intelligent. And you know, this this is not to say this is not to talk down and say, oh, you know, these things are useless, because they're they're actually pretty damn interesting. You can sit there and have a bloody conversation with a computer. That's like wild. Um, you know, this was, I mean, fundamentally, like traditionally, sorry, speaking, this was thought of as the point of reaching general intelligence. Um, you know, unfortunately for the nerds, uh, that wasn't, uh, the outcome of figuring out language. You know, what we figured out was that language is definitely, or at least the 80 20 rule applies to language. You know, you can get 80% of the language production by, you know, maybe 20% of like maybe what language is made up of, right? You know, um, the other 80% I don't think will, uh, will ever achieve because the other 80% has, as I said, something to do with consciousness or agency or intent, et cetera. But we have found a way to use the law of large numbers, uh, to do pretty miraculous things, uh, in the domain of language. And, you know, what these, probability machines like chat GPT do is they probabilistically string words together in a basically a sophisticated autocomplete such that it tells you something that is as if a human read it. Now, not a very intelligent human, not a very creative human, not a very uh, unique thinking human, but definitely sounds like some form of human built it. And this is where I guess we go into what I call midwit obsolescence technology is that you know, much of what you'll get out of ChatGPT is something that some midwit in some bureaucratic institution would have written, you know, someone for New York Times or CNN or something like that. Just like fucking a bunch of words that don't actually say or mean or, you know, do anything, but they're just written. And, you know, to me, that's really ironic. It's that the the very people who these models are most likely to replace are the same kind of people who built these things, uh, which to me is it's quite funny. And that's why I said, like, you know, maybe the, the greatest invention here is the midwood obsolescence piece. So I don't know if you want me to stop there for a bit before we go on to what I decided to do in this space. Um, or if you want me to continue. Yeah, only one point about that. It's it's funny how a funny observation is like computers in movies from the 70s and early 80s were doing exactly this. You were talking to a computer. What they didn't predict is that graphics would outpace this kind of technology people thought that this would be the thing the way around, early yeah. on but but uh we haven't had it until now really that the computers could could do these things yeah yeah i mean it's it's computation once again like if we if we had to pick what element of intelligence you know we've sort of cracked here is we've we've cracked the language element of computational intelligence and you know my, my, my understanding, at least, is that's quite narrow in the broad spectrum of what intelligences are, right? Like we mentioned earlier with like treaties have an intelligence, you know, like the panther has like incredible physical bodily intelligence. Motherfucking panther can jump from a tree to a tree. Good luck, you know, the computer doing that. So, so like the, the, these things, you know, vary and it's, it's, you know, it's very easy for us to, you know, human beings are, are like that. We, we, you know, our imagination extrapolates things out. Like I remember when ChatGPT first came out, they're like, you know, GPT 3.5, you know, it was trained on the whole internet, which is wrong in the first place, but you know, that's what everyone was saying. And like ChatGPT 4 is going to be an order of magnitude bigger and then an order of magnitude. And like within 12 months, we'll have AGI and, you know, like it's all over. And like there was this guy that I was following when I first went down the rabbit hole. And he's, you know, one of the so-called best uh, AI engineers in the world. And for the last year, I swear to God, 90% of his videos, the thumbnail says AGI around the corner, like months away, months away. <laughs> it's just like the same thing over. I'm like, bro, you don't get it. Speaking of speaking about pattern recognition, the, the, it's so funny because that AGI is around the corner or a Skynet is coming or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds a lot like other, you know, tabloid journalism, like, oh, they finally found life on Mars. The, mm -hmm. that's a, that has been a headline in popular science magazines for 40 years now. Yeah, yeah, the the sea levels are rising, we're all going to die, you know, like the it's you know, it's blazing hot in Europe, everyone's going to burn. So so but but the, but the the pattern I recognize here is that journalism sort of cracked that code as well, like by 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 being deliberate midwits, they created 
uh, 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 an analog AI before AI was invented because totally. like AI is totally like replaces journalism first, right? Because it's so easy to write some bullshit about some other bullshit. It's 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 literally parroting. This touches on an interesting point. So like one of, one of the things we've realized with these models is that they're, they're essentially mirrors of what you train them on. And I think fundamentally, because most of the shit out there on the internet these days has just been written by the middle of the bell curve midwits, like think about like the average blog. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's in the word, it's average, you know, like think about the average, you know, newspaper, the average, you know, write up some like all of this sort of stuff. So, so that makes up the corpus of data. Think about Wikipedia. Like, you know, if you want to think what mid is, like go read Wikipedia um, and, you know, you sort of get a sense of this stuff. And this is what a lot of the models are just trained on. Like whether they're open source or closed source, it doesn't matter. Like the, the, the kind of corpus of data that these things are trained on is pretty similar. Like, you know, Falcon, Llama, ChatGPT, you name it, you know, the new competitors, all this sort of stuff. It's all very similar. You know, may, maybe arguably the only one that's substantially different at this point is Elon's one that he's messing around with because he's got Twitter data in there, and Twitter is like you know definitely a different data source. But you know, we'll um you know we'll, we'll sort of see where this goes. But yeah, you, you touch on an interesting point, which is if the majority of stuff, if eighty percent of the stuff that's out there that's, that's been written by midwits, then you know the model is obviously going to sound like a midwit, which is essentially what it is. So, so you told me that when when you built the spirit of Satoshi, that in order to train it, uh, for lack of a better word, you you need to rewrite everything into questions and answers. Once again, depending on the outcome, right? So, like if we want to, um, so, so this is the mirroring that I just mentioned before. Is if you want a model to answer questions, you need to train it with question and answer pairs. So you basically need to give it examples. Um, there's no point in getting big chunks of paragraphs from books and feeding it because there's no example of a question or an answer there. So these things, as I said, th- this is actually perfect segue from what we were saying is like that they're mirroring machines. Um, so they, they, you know, the, the patterns that you give it enough times, uh, it seems to be able to reconstruct that back at you. And, this this is why we wanted to try and build a Bitcoin model is because, you know, Bitcoiners have their own style of language, you know, their own sort of model of the world, the way we understand stuff, the way we perceive stuff. And, you know, there's a large corpus of information out there around Bitcoin, you know, like, I mean, there's everything from, you know, Bitcoin and praxeology to Bitcoin and mushrooms to Bitcoin and yoga to Bitcoin and death metal, you name it, whatever, right? It's all out there. Um, you know, later we'll talk about Bitcoin and Nietzsche, which is something I've started to write about. So there's like, there's, there's all sorts of stuff out there. And I think that's broad enough for you to be able to, um, fingers crossed, uh, build a Bitcoin language model, which is not something like, I, I want to be very clear. This is not something that knows anything. It's just something that reflects, uh, what some, you know, you could guess like aggregate of what the Bitcoin paradigm thinks, like, it could reflect uh, elements of that. And you can almost think of the reflection almost as a, like, it's not like a straight mirror. It's kind of like a, you know, like a cracked mirror. So depending on how you prompt it, it'll reflect a different element. You know, you could ask it, you know, tell me something more like safety or more like breed love or Jeff Bruce, Knud or whatever, like, you know, it, it adapts. So it's like a, it's like a simultaneously high fidelity, but multi, uh, faceted, uh, reflection. And, and that's, that's very interesting. Once again, like, I don't want to sound like I'm completely bagging out AI. It's, it's obviously, you know, humans are really funny. Like two years ago, you would have said like, oh, you can talk to computers. You'd be like, get the fuck out of here. And then all of a sudden you can talk to computers. Everyone's like, oh my God, it's going to take over the world. And then a year later, everyone's like bored and, you know, onto the next current thing. Right. So it's like, it is miraculous. It is very, very interesting. But, you know, the, the question for me becomes, okay, Cool tool. What do we use it for? Do we use it to like basically entrain everybody on the planet to become midwits uh, and make more and more people midwits, or should we attempt to like fork off and you know build a version that you know represents a different concept of the world? The, the, the Ubermensch, the rem- the remnant. <laughs> yes. I mean, I wanted to call the business Remnant AI at one point. <laughs> this is so interesting that you use the word mirrors, mirrors consciousness, because that's that's one of the deeper points we got into with Jeff Booth the other day about um, 
how reality is a mirror of your consciousness. And we got mm, into mm. this talk about, you know, the quantum mechanics and the double split experiment and to which extent the mind creates reality. And the, the, the tweetable quote from the episode was that uh, uh, reality is a mirror of your consciousness. So we're, this is sort of a life imitating art, art imitating life type of, type of deal that the AI is actually, the, the more you train it, the more it becomes like a mirror of what we are. Um, yeah. Yeah. And also, yeah, I was very impressed by, by Spirit of Satoshi's condensed version of the alchemy chapter from my book. Like, and uh, it, it came up with its own word, uh, quantum money, which sounds like a tabloid term, but, but it explained it very thoroughly and uh, got, got the points. And uh, yeah, it was really cool. Yeah, I mean, mind you, that wasn't entirely the AI. Either. So that's like we use the AI plus ourselves internally. So I just want everybody to know that full disclosure, you know, so when they start using Spirit Satoshi, it's like, oh, it didn't produce this. Well, no, like it's it's still a work in progress. But yeah, there's uh, there's some interesting insights and some nuggets that can pull. And this is once once again, it's like human beings, will, you know, where we innovate is when two or you know, multiple ideas kind of like, clash right and somewhere in that venn diagram we're able to extract something we're like oh you know this is this is something fresh something new and you know to to some degree these models uh may offer up a way to do that sometimes but it, it, i think it's almost like a lottery right so most of the times like you know you'd be like regenerate 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 and it's not gonna produce anything useful and then all of a sudden like it'll plop one thing out you're like oh shit, that's actually kind of cool, quantum money. And you know, you, you roll with that. So, you know, once again, it just reinforces the fact that these things are tools and it's it's up to humans to use the tool. Um, you know, it's not like, you know, I just, I'm sick and tired of people just running around being like, oh, you know, AI is going to take over everything. And it's like, like, it's no man, like just like computers automated a bunch of things. Like we don't sit there and draw spreadsheets on a piece of paper anymore. Like, Excel does that, but you need to use Excel. You know, the, the same thing with these tools, like you just need to act, you know, you need to use them intelligently and, and the, the intelligence in using them comes in two ways. It's like number one, finding things that you can do that you can ideally like automate, but also not automating to the degree that you become stupid and can't think anymore. Like I know people that sit there and they use it for all their ideation. Um, or, you know, they get it to write stuff for them. Like there was apparently some Bitcoin book that the dude wrote with, um, using chat GPT primarily. And to me, that's first, it's an abomination, but, um, second, like uh, I'll, I'll clarify here. It's an abomination to get an AI to write your book and then say you wrote it. Like if, you know, maybe you write a book and just say the AI wrote it. That's kind of cool. But, um, you know, to, to do that, I think what it does is it actually weakens your own muscle of writing and of thinking. And I don't know, there's, there's a couple of threads we can pull on there, but... Yeah, I ju- on that point, I, I, I just heard today about uh, some court case where, where someone was sued for for using text from ChatGPT and trying to cop- uh, copyright it. So you can't really write a book and copyright it. I mean, I think copyright laws are bullshit anyway, but in the current legal system, you can't copy-paste something from from ChatGPT and and release it under your name under uh, without uh, being at least at risk of getting sued by by someone who sued him in the end. That's that's interesting. Yeah, I don't what, know. I, I, I mean, I I um, I just heard this story briefly from a couple of people I talked to today, and I I don't know the intricacies of it. So uh, well, but it sounds like something interesting to look into because like the, the, this is. This is one of the reasons why I don't like intellectual property laws. It's like, how can you copyright words? Like, how can you copyright? It's like Orange Pilap got sued by the company Orange, the mobile service provider Orange in uh, uh, Europe because the word orange is apparently patented, which immediately made me think, okay, who's got the word black? Like, <laughs> there was this uh, this uh, artist who, who, uh, Copy, copyrighted or patented uh, a formula for the deepest black you can make. I think it was called Vanta Black or something like that. And and it, it was that he he was the only one who was allowed to use this color of black in art anywhere. Just similar insanity. And I think some people did some uh, made uh, 
like counterfeit versions of that or something and 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 used it to to devalue it it was it was some fun stuff but it's yeah. so retarded i mean black is just the, <laughs> the absence of light that's what it is yeah. but apparently it can be patented so on to nietzsche this is very interesting you 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 just showed us an article here that you're working on for or have written for uh, for an upcoming issue of uh, the bitcoin times it's about nietzsche and and bitcoin and this this old uh, you've dug up the old idea of the ubermensch which which i find interesting and how the urge for power is not necessarily a bad thing so uh, uh, and that power um, this notion that power corrupts my uh, is is off because it's so diluted by by I guess this is this was a, is my interpretation from just skimming through the article but that I, I agreed with a lot of the points like that uh, um, money does not corrupt if the money is not corrupted itself like you need corrupt money in order for for money to corrupt the soul so, so can you unpack the article a bit for us and tell us what it's yeah. Called? I think I think we are um, we are drowning in a in a world full of like Marxist leftist French revolutionist platitudes like things like oh power is evil and you know like we are all in this together and you know the average man and all this sort of stuff and I think what we've done is we've devolved society into this um, praise of the peasants you know like or the the, the praise of like the the average man, like we, we've, we've shunned, uh, excellence as an ideal. We've shunned, you know, greatness. And like, we've, we've forgotten that there, there was fundamentally extraordinary, incredible men throughout history. We literally changed the course of, course of everything. Um, and, you know, there was this, uh, recent, uh, article written about like, uh, you know, Napoleon, right? Like the, the new movie. And I think something about the article in the headline was, um, uh, no matter how much we progress as a society, we still can't get away from the stupid idea that these great men who influenced the world. And like, you know, it was one of those classic New York Times midwit articles, right? And, you know, th- there's like, there's like a, a deep level of like resentment, envy in that kind of thing, right? It's like you see someone who has fundamentally done more than you and is therefore better than you. Like you, you immediately need to sit there from your shitty little computer and just like write out uh something about how no uh, you know Napoleon was short and fuck him and you know yeah fuck every great person like that's basically what their um what their stuff amounts to and honestly like over the last couple of years I've I've started to really question this narrative like you know question the pleb narrative question like the kind of even like the word we are all satoshi kind of pisses me off we're not all fucking satoshi satoshi did something greater than all of us did so shut the fuck up you're not satoshi like all all of these things sort of like grind my gears the wrong way and i think it's about time that we recognize the the biggest problem i think even more more great than the money being broken is that people's uh relationship to life the will of life to vitality, to excellence, I think that's broken. And I actually think that's what preceded bringing us to the state where we decided to debase the money. Um, so, so in fact, like I've come to this realization that it's, you know, the money is not the root cause of all the problems. There's something upstream, which leads us to the point where we are willing to debase the money as a civilization. And then things accelerate downwards. Um, so like the decay sets in much earlier. And, and I think for our Western modern world, that decay started with the French Revolution, not, uh, not in 1971. Um, so it starts, started beyond that. But no, but the, the, the French Revolution is, is, um, uh, interesting here because they, they killed a lot of, uh, <laughs> monarchs and lords during that, right? And that's the, so, so I, I guess your point is that the envy drove that revolution. A hundred percent. Hundred percent. You look at what you know, Rose Pierre. What was he? He was Mark. He was the the he was the genesis of communism. Like that's where it all started. Like Karl Marx emulated his thing on Rose Pierre and said, "No, we need to do this a bit better." And he found um, the 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 right class and the right message to really drive 
leftism, liberalism, and all these sort of ideals. And since then, the world's been suffering. But the revolution wouldn't, it, it doesn't, it didn't come out of nowhere. These people were pissed off because the, the, the people in power were abusing it to some extent, right? To, to some extent. So there was, there was a bit of, um, there was a bit of bad luck and a bit of lack of strength from the monarchy and the leadership at the time. I, I believe it was Louis, the, is it Louis XIV that got guillotine or was it 16? I always read some numbers. 16. It was 16, right? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, 14th was Louis the Great, right? Like the guy who, yeah, he was the base one. So like if Louis the 14th was around, um, I don't think the French Revolution would have happened. 16th was a bit of a pussy. Okay, so so okay, let's get the names right. Louis the Based and Louis the Debased. Yes, Deba. Exactly. There we go. Done. So Louis the Debased was uh, was a bit of a pussy. He he basically preferred just keeping as private as possible, like reading his books and all this sort of stuff. So he had a he he didn't have a like what you know Nietzsche might have called like a vital soul, right? Or he he wasn't a strong man, you know, in that cycle. Strong men, uh, good times, good times, weak men, etc. Right. So. He had kind of inherited this uh, this powerful, fundamentally um, well formed uh, society, and then there was a couple of players like your um, your Benjamin Disraeli, your um, your like there was a couple of the aristocrats who started at some point promoting the idea that uh, we need to give uh, more rights to common people, etc. And there was a there was a series of like unfortunate events at the time now like it's been a couple of years since i've really dug into the french revolution but there was some losses out at sea there was some bad luck uh with the sugar imports and all that sort of stuff there was uh some bad luck with famines like uh i think there was a drought or flooding or something like that where there was you know back to back i think a season or two of like lack of wheat and grain and People started looking for someone or something to blame. And Louis the Sixteenth, instead of solving the problem, basically abdicated his responsibility. And the the interesting thing about the French Revolution is that there was no like call to kill the king in the beginning. That kind of got fermented over time. Like there was, you know, th- there was the, the the French people never wanted to like behead their king, but it was almost like a betrayal of the the new wealthy that had come into the aristocratic class that were more from a merchant class. They weren't from the old feudal class. They were more from, you know, they, they were, they'd kind of like made money as the traders, you know, the money changes. And they came in and they started, you know, fermenting this like, uh, idea of, Hey, you know, we need something new because it's all the King's fault. It's all the monarchy's fault that, um, these famines are happening, et cetera, et cetera. And like, as, as we know, Things don't happen overnight, right? Like the Nazis didn't start killing everyone overnight. Like th- things happen step by step by step by step. And all of a sudden, you know, like uh, inch by inch, a year later, you're in a completely different place. And and that's kind of a similar thing that happened uh, in the French Revolution. But from that, you had these characters stem like Robespierre, um, who was, you know, the, the big uh, sort of you know, the, the leader of the, the liberal, uh, the, the Jacobins basically at the time. Was it the leader of the Jacobins? I think so. Um, and the Jacobins were the original Marxists. They were the original communists. Like they wanted to strip everything from the monarchs and give everything uh, out to everybody. And I mean, you know, that ended in like the terror. Uh, you know, basically they started killing everybody and like surveillance, community surveillance, dobbing on your neighbor started in French Revolution. That was the first time that kind of stuff was done. Like they went and they encouraged, particularly, 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 particularly the women, to dub on their husbands and to gossip and to spread that information. And they went and started like killing everybody who dissented, um, you know, for the good of the average man. And um, and then the thing became so deranged that they all started like killing each other because you know it was just like you know classic communism, right? In action, and then in the end, uh, Robespierre got uh, guillotined. <laughs> so it was just this big fucking clusterfuck where you know there was more bloodshed um, during that period of quote unquote you know revolution and liberating themselves from the oppressive patriarchy that they absolutely like France was the most powerful nation on the planet by orders of magnitude, and they 
basically decapitated themselves out of their own stupidity. Um, and then that's when England uh, took over, became dominant, et cetera, et cetera. And then like France has been downhill uh, ever since. Yeah, it's quite something like the, the speaking of greatness and monarchies, I, I, my mind goes directly to Austria-Hungary, that empire, which was made out of small cantons with lords and stuff and small kings. Uh, and there, the brain power that came out of that in uh, the late 19th century, it's just staggering. Like all the big names in philosophy and music and you name it like this. Some, we're, we're doing something wrong now that we can't produce that kind of, that kind of folk. A hundred percent. Because like w- what you get when you build uh, dynastic wealth, for example, and you, and you, Basically, and people don't like to talk about this, but like what the what the aristocratic and uh, aristocrat just means the best. Like you know, aristocratia is like uh, the uh, rule of the best. Uh, so it's made up of two words uh, in in Greek, and what it meant was like selectively choosing you know who you wanted to breed with, you know, fundamentally, and training your children, your offspring to be the best so that they could carry on the family's wealth and continue that. And what you got after generations of doing so is, yes, sometimes you got like pathetic entitled little shits, um, but more often than not, you got the Wagners, you got the von Mises, like, you know, Ludwig von Mises was part of a, a, um, a cultured, like count aristocratic class. Like you get people who have the space to think and to create and to produce stuff instead of being, you know, just like we are today, like we don't know which way to turn. Inflation's fucking climbing. We can't, you know, feed our families. You know, the, the wife and the husband have to work. The kids are fucking neglected. Like it's a disaster. Whereas when you have the capacity to, to pass down wealth, you can actually build culture. And, and if there's one thing missing, like really, 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 really deeply missing from the modern world is like, is culture. Like America was probably the last place where we got a dose of culture, you know, between like the sixties and the, and the nineties. And, you know, that was like, like one last hurrah of like, you know, America did create its own, like, you know, those Hollywood blockbusters, you know, there was like cool music, all all that sort of shit. And now that's like dead, finished, gone. There's no culture. So Robocop was actually the peak of uh, American cu- culture, I guess. Probably. Robocop or, you know, one of those like around then and, you know, we ain't got shit anymore. All right. You might have noticed that we've recently partnered with Amber App. After our episode with Izzy, their CEO and our close friend, we knew we would have to partner with them in some way. If you haven't seen our episode with Izzy, definitely go check it out. You'll see why it's such a great fit. And honestly, they're following the orange glowing light, like Izzy always says. And that's exactly what we try to do here at the Freedom Footprint Show. The big news about Amber App is that on Jan 3, 2024, they're going to be launching their version 2.0. I've seen some of the screenshots and it looks fantastic. They're going to be including a non-custodial on-chain wallet, an anonymous lightning wallet, a fiat wallet. And finally, it's going to be an exchange, of course. It's going to be just this super app. They're also going to be launching globally. Everyone's going to be able to use it. We're really excited about all that. Stay tuned with us and you'll hear all about it. And for now, check out their website, amber.app and the episode with Izzy to find out more. Next up, Wasabi Wallet, the privacy by default, open source, non-custodial Bitcoin wallet with CoinJoin built in. It's the easy to use, comprehensive, affordable way to make your coins private. And the best part is they've been making huge improvements to the app. They're really focusing on the user experience, adding advanced features for power users. They just keep getting better. You send your coins to your Wasabi wallet and they get combined with loads of other coins using the Wabi Sabi protocol. So they're private on the other end. Your tracks are covered so you can work on expanding your freedom footprint without worrying about your privacy. So check out wasabiwallet.io and download Wasabi today. This ties in beautifully to your article because, like, uh, I've I've been thinking that about this for years. That uh, Bitcoin actually, uh, what generational wealth means is that we're all a uh, uh, potential feudal lords now because we can actually plan for generations ahead. And some people will, and those people's grandchildren will be in positions of more power when they grow up. 
So, so it, like, how does that tie into your article and what's your thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, this is one of the biggest, like, uh, unpopular opinions in Bitcoin, right? Like Bitcoin, Bitcoiners generally like to talk about, you know, banking the unbanked and all this sort of stuff. And you say the word feudalism and they have an allergic reaction. They're like, Oh my God, he's, you know, he's a fascist. And, you know, they, they sort of run in the opposite direction. Uh, I actually think, as, as you just said, you, you just really hit the nail on the head. One of Bitcoin's most fundamental benefits or the, you know, the fundamental impact that it's going to have on civilization is that it will allow certain families, certain holders to preserve their wealth across time to such a degree that it becomes generational wealth and the generations that that are most able to continue sustaining that wealth. So it's almost like a meritocratic feudalism, right? And this is what I think is like yeah. peak civilization, right? Is that you can have the wealth passed down to you and you can be a complete monkey and squander it, or you can actually build on that by breeding, by building a family, by training your kids, like all of that sort of stuff that the traditional aristocrats did. Like that's what the kings and queens and the aristocratic classes did. They put they put a shitload of effort into thinking about who do I not only just strategically marry with, but who is, you know, the right person, you know, the like that is gonna help me breed the best kids, et cetera, et cetera. Like all of that sort of stuff was the kind of thinking we had. We kind of lost all of that in the last few hundred years because now you can't say anything, otherwise you're a fucking eugenicist. Yeah, uh, so so the, what people need to get is that this does not automatically mean that we all become Tywin Lannister. It means uh, it, it means that responsible people will be able to be feudal lords because feudalism had a lot of problems because you could acquire wealth by force way easier than you can on a Bitcoin standard, I guess. Well, there's that. Yeah, there's that. And I think the the piece about Bitcoin that, you know, is very, very special here is the one, it's much harder to take it by force. So you need to be more intelligent about how you take it. But also number two is mistakes uh, have a real cost. Um, so you can't print your way out of losing your Bitcoin. And 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 that's what that is. That's the hack that has happened in the modern world is that a a small percentage of like absolutely ugly, disgusting, you know, vile people have figured out that they can pay for every single one of their mistakes with somebody else's money uh, by printing it. And therefore they are not the best. They are the worst of people because it's kind of like when you go watch a sport, right? And you, you know, someone cheats. Nobody likes the fucking cheater. And, and, and that's the game sort of that we're playing at the moment is like the, the people winning are the, the people who, who are cheating. Like they, they have MBAs. They like have PhDs in how to cheat and avoid either getting busted or, you know, even if they do get busted, still make you feel bad about it or blame it on somebody else. It was like, it was him that did it, not me. So it's like, you know, the, 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 the consequences associated to poor decision making and irresponsibility. Uh, literally shared amongst everyone. And this goes all the way back to, once again, the French Revolution is the French Revolution. When you put the power in people's hands and allow everybody to vote, then everybody simultaneously becomes responsible for everything. Whereas when you had a feudal class, there was different responsibilities at different levels. Um, you know, the peasants were not responsible for protecting the territory. It was the knights. And when the knights like they're the ones who went and fought, right? So like everybody had a different uh, responsibility. And now everybody's responsibility is intermingled. Therefore, nobody's responsible for anything except the fact that you're responsible for being born a male, being white, and for the weather, right? They're the three things we're all responsible for. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, if if it's true, like the the, the things we talk, we've been talking about a lot, a lot lately, that the reality is a reflection of your actions, and your consciousness and your conscious decisions to do this or that. The uh, rise of uh, transsexual athletes winning women's sports is exactly that. It's a reflection of uh, uh, of this bullshit going on on top when cheaters can win the game of money. Exactly. That that's so. So we 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 are yeah. We're sort of you know woo woo way like manifesting all of the ugliness that is like inherent in our thoughts we are we are manifesting all the average you know we are manifesting like like we're tearing down anything that 
is reminding us of like the beauty that we're able to create because like inside we've become ugly, we've become envious, we've become resentful. And this was, this was Nietzsche's big sort of lesson out there for humanity. So like, if we orient ourselves around, you know, resentment for greatness and praise of average and praise of equality, we are going to create a civilization that, uh, devolves into what he called the last man, right? And the last man, we today would call it the lemmings or the NPCs, um, or, you know, the, the peasants, whatever you want to call them, right? But yeah. Okay. Uh, I had so many thoughts here. Like, uh, one of my favorite sentences from one of my own books is a sentence I stole directly from Daniel Prince. And it's about schooling. Uh, you know, he's talking about homeschooling all the time. And it's this, if you're a straight A student, you excelled uh, at being average. Interesting. Uh, it, it, it's that. so true. Uh, so uh, I was helping my son with his maths homework today and yesterday and the day before that, because he has homework every day, which totally takes the the fun out the of fun. learning. Yep. Yeah. And the way maths is still taught in schools uh, is you get these problems that you need to solve and the teacher looks at how you solve them and not the result you get so to me maths is all about understanding the world and and getting the the correct result in the end and how you get there is none of the teacher's fucking business correct. you should just yes. get the fucking yes. best you, you should can i solve the problem or not and if if a a type of solution is suitable for my brain, then I should use that mm -hmm. solution mm -hmm. and not some forced fucking bullshit. Formula, so, right? Yeah. 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 So it's all that, that is calculation. It's not mathematics, it's calculation. Correct. Mathematics Correct. is about understanding this shit. Thank so, you. and so Thank even you. from this, uh, from this early age, like he's 12 now. So, but, uh, it still baffles me that this is the way we, Public schools teach children how to do stuff. And of course, it, it makes sense when you see it that they don't want obedient, obedient slaves and not thinking people on the other side. It rewards obedience more than anything else. Yeah. I mean, this is the plague of the last man. Man, you just flashed me back to, um, to my high school years because that was one of the things like then this, you know, I was a kid. This was long before I read nature or understood Bitcoin or agnosia or anything like that. But I used to argue with teachers all the time. They, they, They'd make us memorize formulas. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm going to work it out myself. And, you know, I'd, I'd always have brawls. And, dude, I was the best mathematician in our class um, by far. I, I went to the, to the exams without a calculator and I whooped everyone's ass um, because I just had a way of, like, working out the problems. And that's exactly what I did. And that's how I got through high school. That's how I got scholarships and all this sort of stuff. Um, and it was all because... I went and solved problems and I didn't, I didn't have this language for it. I didn't know what I was doing. Like I didn't know that I was doing something different to calculation or formulas. I just like hated this idea that everyone in the class was just like following a formula and just like, yep, here's my formula. Bad, copy bad. across. Okay. Now I just like put this into a calculator and I get the answer. I was like, you didn't fucking learn anything. You literally didn't learn anything. You fucking no, moron. Exactly. You just like typed in some buttons on a calculator. What the fuck? No. And this, this week of uh, helping him with his homework is it's, it's been taking me back to, to my school years and how much I hated them. Uh, I remember in, yeah, I was around 14, 15, maybe. And, uh, my English teacher downgraded me when I thought I had, uh, performed well and that I would get the highest grade. Instead, I got an even lower grade than I got because, uh, and I came to her with like that. Oh, I, I, uh, I, I scored top points on this national test or whatever. So why are you downgrading me? It's because you can tell by the way you do your homework that you, uh, you write synonyms instead of the words I want you to write. Yeah, but that means I know more English. Like, <laughs> I, wow. uh, so, but, but this is, these are just two examples of, or three of how, uh, how fucked that is. So, okay, back, back to, okay, back to Nietzsche. Back to Nietzsche. I, I mean, I, I, I just pulled up the article because I wanted to like pull in a couple threads here. So like one of the, uh, I guess sections in the essay is, uh, quality over quantity. And I think this is like one of the big misconceptions in the modern world as well. Like there, there's a, 
like it's funny, man, etymology is such an interesting, yeah, etymology and philology and just like playing around with words is so interesting. Um, like you look at quality and equality, like are almost like diametrically opposed. When you get equality, you get the opposite of quality, you get mass, you get quantity, you get numbers, um, you know, you get... Mm. So sh- should we use the uh, term A quality instead or <laughs> instead of E quality? Uh, no, we should just this. We should get rid of equality and just like stick with quality. That's it. That All right. should be All right. the focus, because like, you know, I, I explore this in the essay, and like I, I've actually got a dedicated article about quality versus equality for um, Bitcoin Magazine that'll get published in their last edition of the year. But for for this, I touch on it in here, and I kind of let me let me pull out next uh, excerpts from here. So I say, you know, second, Bitcoin is money with a high degree of quality. The quantitative element is fixed and predetermined, making it something with an increase in quality and therefore value over time. That which has quality has weight and energy. Bitcoin, like gold, like has gravitas, like it's got some sort of substance. It means something because it is scarce. The quantity is finite. When you hand someone a gold coin, you can feel it. There's something visceral about it. You know, and Bitcoin carries a similar charge despite only having existed for 40 years. Um, and then I ask, like, imagine the charge that it will carry after another half century. It's the same reason a mountain uh, has presence. You know, something that has been there for a long time, something that has presence, has gravitas, has weight. And, you know, the, the next paragraph I want to read this is, contrast that with fiat money, the abstract, flimsy, promissory note that can be created out of thin air and changed on a whim. It lacks both weight and substance. It is conceptual and theatrical in nature. Even think about the term quantitative easing. You know, what does this process mean? Like quantitative easing is the process of increasing the quantity of the money by making it easier to produce. This, of course, occurs at the expense of its promise and the quality and makes money easy or soft. So therefore, people rightly do not trust it like they do a metal and even less so when it's digits on a screen. Uh, This is why fiat money is in a death spiral. It is hollow and devoid of life force. It carries nothing but the empty promise of a group of bureaucrats. So, like, I think there's, you know, this this quantity or quality uh, discussion is really, really important. And I mean, it perfectly ties into Nietzsche because Nietzsche's whole philosophy revolves around quality, vitality, energy, power, as opposed to the quantity-oriented philosophy of equality, democracy, the masses, the vote, and all this sort of crap. Yeah, qu- quantitative easing is qualitative difficulty you know, or decreasing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's qualitative destruction, basically. Quantitative easing yeah. is qualitative destruction. Yeah, that's so interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that that dichotomy is everywhere in in Bitcoin. Like, uh, uh, yeah, it, it really is. So, and and the. Um, I mean, you, you you see the opposite. Like, this is one of the things that I love about Bitcoin, and I, I've said this on a couple of different spaces before. Is we live in a you know in a world of like mass media, mass plastics, mass fucking you know the we now have five thousand friends on you know on Facebook instead of like we used to have you know fifty friends in the community. Like everything is mass oriented. Like you know mass food, mass seed oils, mass fucking production, mass GMO, like all of this stuff we have, like everything is becoming inflated. Like even chat GPT and AI is like, now we're going to have more blogs and more words and more content and more data and more websites and more tools and more fucking everything. And like the, the entire focus of the world at the moment is on quantity, not on quality. And that's why nothing works anymore. It's like, you know, you, you, you buy something, it breaks and you just buy the same plastic shit again and you just keep buying shit versus having a focus on quality. And I think this is, um, I don't know, it's, for me, it's a big takeaway for people to, you know, stop and think like we need, like if, if you make, here's the thing, if you make the North Star of your civilization quantity or equality, for example, they sort of sit in the same bucket, you'll absolutely eradicate quality and then the jokes on you because you'll eradicate the quantity as well because everyone will start dying off from starvation and irrelevance but if you make the the focus quality you'll push the bounds you have to you'll raise all other boats and you'll actually make room for quantity 
and life can continue to prosper. And it's just, it's just so interesting to me that, you know, we have made quantity the focus or equality the focus. And in the process, we're destroying like, we're destroying both the quantum side of things and the, uh, and the qualitative side of things. And it's just so, yeah. I don't know, it just becomes so evident after a while. You're like, man, what are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. Uh, it's like the, the, uh, the only way to reach equality in a society is through natural disasters, such as, you know, a volcano or, or a, a flooding or a, a tsunami or a, an earthquake or communism or socialism. Like, because they're all natural disasters. Uh, yes. Some of them <laughs> designed to, 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 to uh, deliberately trying to make people equal. That's extremely evil at its core. Yes. The it only really way is. to do that is you can't make a person better from a position of power. You can make them worse. You can give them the tools to make themselves better. But, you know, it's like teach, give a man a fire and warm him for a day and set the man on fire and warm him for the rest of your life. Like, that's, <laughs> the, uh, maybe I got that wrong. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> that <one's true. laughs> I'm going to use that one. That one's fantastic. Um, it's a well, let, let me, quote. Yeah, <laughs> I, I love it. Um, man, I've still I've still got to start listening to his book. I actually I, I downloaded the other one, Guards Guards, that you mentioned. So it's sitting there. Uh, oh great! I've got to get to it. I was just finishing up another Wilbur Smith book, eight books in. It's fucking yeah, I good. started one. Uh, did but, you start uh, the Lion Feeds? Yeah, I did, and I really like the language. I really like the words, but uh, I, I don't really like fiction. <laughs> like I just realized I can't read fiction. Like I don't have the time or like. I would need to 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 read that all in one go, like I c- because I can't focus. Chuck it on two times speed and just like chill out, relax when you're traveling or whatever, and just like follow the story. Yeah. Trust me. You just, I mean, name, it's a muscle. It's a muscle. Yeah. You gotta like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you yeah, gotta yeah. build it for my next flight to Australia or something. Okay. Yeah. Deal. We'll come to Brazil. The show is also sponsored by Orange Mill App, the Bitcoin only social network where you can stack friends who stack sats. You can connect with your favorite Bitcoiners on the app, make local connections, and even connect with Bitcoiners around the world. You can see what's going on in your local area and connect with Bitcoiners around you. I've been to multiple events organized on Orange Pill app, and they brought Bitcoiners together from all over. And now with group chat, it's easier than ever to stay in touch with all of your Bitcoin friends. The best part is that you know it's high signal. There's no spam on Orange Pill app because everyone pays to be there. So download Orange Pill app on Apple or Android, send me or Canoe to DM, and start building your local network of Bitcoiners today. Next up, the Bitcoin way. Their mission is to onboard, educate, and remove barriers to taking self-custody of your Bitcoin. They cover everything from cold wallets to nodes, no KYC Bitcoin purchases, inheritance planning, payments, and more. Whether you're new to Bitcoin or you're an experienced Bitcoiner looking to expand your freedom footprint, or you know someone who this sounds perfect for, the Bitcoin way has something for you. They have a skilled team, well-versed in the Bitcoin space, and their goal is to make all the complexities of Bitcoin as straightforward as possible for everyone. And the best part is you can get started with a free 30-minute call with their team. Go to thebitcoinway.com contact for more info. Our newest sponsor is Geyser. They are the portal to the creator economy on Bitcoin. On Geyser, creators can monetize their work through their communities in a social and engaging way and supporters can send sats to their favorite projects. Geyser has also recently integrated with Zaps and Podcasting 2.0, so every Zap sent to a Geyser address shows up on the Geyser page. We have a Geyser fund ourselves. It's the best way to support our show directly with Bitcoin. So whether you're a creator or a supporter, check out Geyser at geyser.fund today. There was something I wanted to say about what we were just talking about before. Oh yeah, actually that. Uh, equality equality of... Um, so. People go on about like, uh, you know, equality of outcome is obviously evil. What we should be focusing on is equality of opportunity. And, you know, I, when you actually think about what that means is equality of opportunity, like equality of outcome is fundamentally evil because it's just like, it's, it's about as fucking dumb as you could possibly get. You have to be either, yeah, you, you have to be born with your brain in your asshole or something like that to actually think that that's a good idea. Um, but equality of opportunity is just a stupidity or a fantasy because like people throw it around like, oh yeah, we need to give everybody the same opportunity. But that is fundamentally impossible because as you said, unless you blow, like you, you set every volcano off in the world at once and like melt everything and just like 
start the world from scratch, basically confiscate everyone's parents' um, like wealth. So that way everyone starts from scratch. And you then also give everybody the same genetics and same brain and same predisposition and same everything. You're just not going to have the quality of opportunity. Like it's, it's a scam. It's as evil as a quality of outcome. Because what it does, it, it, it removes parenting from the equation completely. Because the only way to do it is, is, is by grave robber tax, like uh, <laughs> inheritance tax. Uh, that's, that's the only way to get anywhere near equality of opportunity. Fortunately, it doesn't work with Bitcoin. Yeah, I mean, grave robber's tax and like some sort of territorial homogenization and like it's it's all of these things it's so but this dumb. thing that, that it's it's uh if you believe that then then what that implies is the outsourcing of responsibility for the next generation from the family to the state that's what it does that's what it effectively means so you put everyone in the same indoctrination camp and you steal all the parents money except for the lunch box or something and uh, and then you uh, and then you mold everyone into the same fucking. I, I mean, I I hate I hate the term because it gets thrown around all the time. As like if it's equality. some sort of virtuous pursuit, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We should strive for equality of uh, opportunity instead. No, heck, not. We shouldn't. We should. We should strive for, uh, for whatever the fuck we want. And I should strive for what I want, and you should strive for what you want. Uh, what you want, like. That's it. E- equality of, uh, yeah, I don't know. Equality of non-interference. That's that's what to strive for. Th- th- this is where it's like, you know, I just think we just burn the word equality altogether and just like focus on fairness and excellence. Like they're the two things because like, you know, at the end of the day, if I want to be excellent and you want to be average, like I'm going to pay the price for being excellent which is I'm going to work my ass off. I'm going to sacrifice time, energy, you know, effort, money, whatever I'm going to do to be that. But then I'm going to reap the rewards for it. You know, if you want to pay the price for being average, it's a very low price, you know, because average is, you know, cheap. Don't do anything. You'll be pretty average. Uh, but you'll also reap those rewards. And, and this is, I mean, this has and always will be the rule of life and the, the bunch of bumbling, average fools, um, or, or, you know, maybe more so like the parasites who saw an opportunity to lie to the average peasant, the average monkey, and teach him to like, feel like he's entitled to something that the excellent person produces has created a world in which like, you know, the, the, the lemmings are weaponized against those who are truly fundamentally great or excellent or productive or anything like that. I mean, this, this is the Ayn Randian uh, reality when she, she described it and like long before she did, like Nietzsche just basically warned about this um, and said that this is exactly where the world's going uh, at a time when nobody would have thought that. Like it was, you know, pre-1900s, you know, Europe was at its peak, all that sort of stuff. And he sensed that this was coming, that this is why I think like he's, one of the greatest prophets uh, of all time in terms of like thinking he, he really, he thought outside of the box fundamentally and outside of the paradigm within which he lived. Like we, we all talk about this stuff today because we you know, live in times of greatest madness, but he, he sensed all this. And I think Bitcoiners don't read enough of people like him, which is unfortunate. And I'm going to hope to change that with some of the stuff that I'm writing coming up soon. Yeah, and uh, to make a devil's ad- slight, somewhat of a devil's advocate point here, on a in a functioning world, on a sound money standard or whatever, pick one. Uh, being average, there's nothing wrong with being average. Most people are average. That's where the word come from, and it's not. There's no wrong in having small goals for your life and not taking on too much, but living a relaxed life uh, where you don't have to you know, use your brain every microsecond of the day. Like, and uh, because becoming becoming excellent, it has a high cost. If you want to, if you want to outperform people, you need to, you know, you can't have as much time with your family. You can't have as much procrastination time. It's just impossible. You, you, you pay the cost both ways. That's the thing, you know, like, we're, we're not, we're not, you know, picking on average people here, we're just saying that the system right now 
rewards, not even averageness, but but worse than this, midwittery or whatever you may call it. Like it, it incentivizes you to to be unproductive and to not strive for anything greater. Yeah, I mean the life's like a like a spear, right? And the the those who are who choose to pay the price of being excellent, they're like the tip of the spear. You know, they're the they're the sharpest, tiniest little point. You know, they, they but they're the, they're what pierces the target, and then you know the the rest is the inertia that um that drives it through. So you know, you fund as you just said, you you fundamentally need excellence, but there's a price to it, and not everybody can be Alexander the Great or Napoleon or Julius Caesar, etc. Like that, they are they are fundamentally different because to get to that echelon, like to be an Elon Musk, be a Peter Thiel or whatever, like you need to fucking that that didn't just happen like it, it there has to be an act that there needs to be an energy and a you know once again a vitality is striving for excellence some sort of some fuel or fire inside of you that like pushes you to get there it's not just gonna happen because you sat on the couch watching netflix all day it just doesn't work no, like I, that. I, I think that's a must quote if if you're reading self-help books and like success books it's probably not for you anyway yeah <laughs> like, that's, a, that's totally and I, I yeah I, I don't remember the exact quote but it's somewhere around and for those of you who don't know life is not a box of fucking chocolates that's for sure like <laughs> you can know what you're gonna get you're gonna get you're gonna reap what you sow that's that's it it's yeah. by, by and large exactly i mean you can't take luck out of the equation because no, like no. Yeah, that's like the one. That's like the one phantom thing. And in many ways, I think luck is, you know, sits in the same realm as like consciousness and agency. It's like this thing that is like you can't define, you can't touch. Like it's ineffable, etc. Like you know, you know, you could call God luck in some sense, right? It's this thing that you you just like it's the variable that you can't take out. Like it reminds me of um the matrix and the architect, right? He's like, you know, we designed everything perfectly. You know, I gave you guys everything and, you know, you still fucked it up somehow. It's like luck, the human element, the, the, the piece of agency, the whatever is in there. It's like the spark of life. And that is different. That is irreplaceable. And, you know, you can predict a lot, but you know, the element of luck is, um, irreducible. Could could I double could I double click on on that a little sure. bit though? Yeah, the, the luck the luck thing. I think this gets misunderstood a lot because luck is is another word for circumstance, whatever circumstance you're in, right? And yes, there there is an element of chance in every micro interaction, right? Hit by a bus being probably the the stereotypical example there, but but luck is also a. a a long-term thing. Someone born in a Western country is in a much better position than someone born in uh, a poverty-stricken neighborhood in South Africa or Brazil or wherever, right? But the thing is, their parents and all of the the background to them is what has put them in that position. It's not in a vacuum. It, it's not that some soul got plucked out of the air and was put into a random body maybe there's people who believe that right but but it, it there there is a lineage to this so so it's the the choice is going back generationally and i think that actually ties back into that your actions matter forward mm -hmm. mm -hmm. your actions matter maybe a long way into the future right and so i i, I think luck is just something that that it, my point is that it, it gets misunderstood uh, i think that that yes there is sort of a random chance aspect to things but but it can't be used to to explain a way that uh people born in different circumstances yeah 100 percent. i mean th this is one of the things you know why it's so um ineffable and indefinable it's there's um like the mind boggles at the amount of things that have to like happen in order for you and i to be born you know as who we were born as you know what i mean like it's just I don't know. Like I, so sometimes, for example, I um, I think about like me, and my brother. Like we're, we're we're basically Irish twins. You know, we're born twelve and a half months apart. I mean, I guess I didn't make the Irish twins window, but close enough, right? And like I don't know. Like when it comes to cognitive comprehension, the guy's about as smart as this bottle of water here. 
like, and drives me fucking insane sometimes. But you know, he's uh, you know he's he's more unique in other ways. Like, um, I don't know, he's been endowed with this like ability to abstain from things. Like, so like he he trains like a machine. This little shit, like he's fucking abbed up. He's never touched a single supplement or like steroid or anything like that in his life. But he looks a hundred times better than people who sit there and like inject themselves with testosterone and a million other things. And like, but he's just got this like weird, like when we were young, my dad used to call him a donkey because he was like stubborn, like a fucking donkey. Like when there was something that he wanted, like whether it's for, for the good, for the bad, whatever, like he just do that. And that's it. Like, it was almost like those, and it, you know, those old bunnies where you like wind them up and you point them in a direction, like and, you know, that's where he goes. So, you know, he, he and I have a real like difference there. And, you know, is, is it luck that we turned out differently, you know, genetically, even being so, so genetically sort of similar? Like, I don't know. I, I don't know how to, def- how to explain this sort of stuff, but there's th- th- that when I think about luck, that's what I mean. Like, it's this, it's this thing, like, it's almost like the fucking roll of the dice, like what made us fundamentally different from, from kids, from babies. Like I started speaking at the age of eight and like, I, you know, I remember my mum and the age of eight, sorry, eight, eight months, fuck's sake, eight months. I was thinking that, yeah, you're pretty good for, for starting that late. Yeah, no, I'm not that retarded. But yeah, no, I, I started speaking at eight months old and my brother didn't start speaking until like two, um, but he started walking, um, you know, almost 12 months earlier than me. Why? I don't know. And that's the kind of stuff I throw in the um, in the bin of luck. I would throw that in the bin of luck as well, but I would not throw like that. There are so many other things like risk management. There should, there should be a word like luck management because, uh, because you can, you can the, like, I am lucky to know you, Alex, and to know another, uh, a whole bunch of great people, but it's not luck. Primarily, it's that I actively is, is, uh, seeked out people to and uh, got to know them, and like, but there's the there's an element of luck to it. I mean, you never know what's going to take off. You never know what people are going to notice of, of your work or anything like that. So there's an element of luck to it. But just like Bitcoin mining, which is also just guessing a random mm-hmm. number, mm-hmm. and that's so proof of work and luck are very tightly connected. Here's uh, totally. here's the thoughts. Totally, totally. That is, yeah. That's like it's 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 pay to play. That's the thing. Like you you you're not gonna be you're not gonna win if you're not gonna play. Um, no, freemium so. freemium isn't free, and uh, proof of work is luck management, basically. It really is. Yeah, that's um, yeah, that's a really good way to frame it. Okay. Uh, do you want me to pull a couple other things, maybe to piss people off before we finish this? Yes. For those of you who don't know, or haven't figured out yet. I mean, uh, Alex is the uh, uh, contrarian's contrarian. So, so please, Alex, piss people off for us. We'd l- would love to hear it. I'm gonna I'm gonna read out a paragraph. So it says uh, most people think that Bitcoin's greatest contribution will be to list the masses up and help the weak. Um, and I say, while that will likely occur, and not for the reasons you think it will, it's my unpopular belief that the more important contribution and impact to mankind will be that Bitcoin makes the strongest stronger, the best better, and the more the most powerful more powerful. Um, and then I sort of subset that by saying, I can already feel you squirming as you read that line. So please read it again. <laughs> Allow me to clarify why this is a good thing and of utmost importance. Then I kind of like go into, you know, you, you know, first of all, I think we can agree on you get more of that, which is rewarded. If you reward theft, uh, you'll get more theft. San Francisco is a perfect example. Participation awards in school reward average students, not those who excel. ESG and, you know, DEI or whatever in the workplace results in hiring for politics instead of competence and giving people money for staying home results in more people staying home, getting fat, lazy, and less productive. So I say the converse is also true. When we reward people for doing a great job, they not only feel recognized, but they feel a drive or a will to do a greater job. So anyway, all of that sort of culminates in a simple formula, which is strong individuals equal strong society, weak individuals equal weak society. So if you want a powerful meritocratic society, you must encourage powerful people and reward them for winning i.e. merit, not for cheating, not for lying, not for stealing, not for quitting, not for participating, 
but for achieving. And like, I think this, this year is sort of to tie it back to the, obviously the line that'll piss people off, like making the strongest, stronger and the best, better and the most powerful, more powerful is that Bitcoin, like any good technology, like, I mean, money is a force multiplier. And, you know, if you have a functional, sound, incorruptible money, it is going to multiply yeah, people who, who are fundamentally the best and whatever, what they, you know, like your definition of the definition of best matters here. It's like someone who is, you know, the, the best kind of manager or the best business owner or the best product owner or the best father or the best, you know, builder or whatever, like they will get better. Um, Abort- because they're not being, perhaps, I mean, that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, but I yeah. couldn't resist the Knut out provocateur, you Alex. Yeah, uh, maybe, I, I, maybe. I did my best. Maybe yeah. he he might have just won this round. <laughs> no, but I totally get that. Like the uh, the <laughs> uh, that 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 thing about incentivizing the bad behavior is straight out of Hopper. Like Hopper's literature is full of that. Like you get what you what you reward. Like like if you pay for something, you're gonna get that. It's a minimum wage laws. It's 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 literally paying for people to stay home. Yeah, but the, see, this is what the leftards and like a lot of the Bitcoiners just don't get or they don't want to admit, right? Like they just have this fantasy in their mind, yeah. like oh, you know, it's gonna fucking help unbank the bank and all or whatever, debank the bank, the unbanked or what. Like it's just it comes from a place of like I don't know they they, they miss this fact, like they miss that. Uh, yeah, it's the equal opportunity thing. Yes, once again, it, once again, that's where exactly. it comes from. It's, it comes from this notion that people are have it could have equal opportunity, which is which is utopian in every way. And and there's nothing wrong with you know producing more great people because that's also true. Like if you incentivize being great, more great people. Like I know people with an IQ of 155 who work in fucking hot dog stands. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, they could mm-hmm. have done something way better with their lives, but they don't because they live in fucking clown world. Like, like, and you're going to see less of that than on a Bitcoin standard, I think. Well, I hope so. Yeah, like it, it comes back to the orient, the optimization and orientation we spoke about before. When you, when you optimize, when you make your North Star a quality, um, then you, you, you sacrifice quality. And when you make it quality uh, and excellence, You'll you'll get uh, something there for the quantity uh, as well, and in fact, you'll increase the quantity of excellent because life is this thing that wants to expand, and life can only expand if there's some layer of frontier of life pushing, you know, the 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 frontier, and that that is like if there was a diff, like I mean, uh, etymologically speaking, like the word excellence, um, you know, excellere, uh, which is the you know, the roots of it have to do with separating oneself or like a mountain or a peak like it's a it's a protrusion out um that's essentially what uh excellence means it's like it's to it's to push the bounds it's to climb the mountain it's to separate from the the level from the you know from the from the masses and like that that is fundamental like i mean even if you conceptually think about what growth means like, you know, if, if this is your sphere of influence, growth demands that you step outside the sphere of influence and you expand it, you grow it. Like, so all of like, literally the very nature of life is the, is the expansion into, uh, you know, bringing light into darkness. It is the, you know, it's the, the opposite of entropy, right? And I mean, this is precisely why I wrote this article for the, uh, for the energy edition of the Bitcoin Times. So everyone else, like in the Bitcoin Times, like, you know, wrote about nuclear and, uh, you know, Marty Bent, you know, bashed, uh, ESG. Um, there was one in there about like power lines, one in there, uh, about like Simon, what's his name? Julian Simon, who spoke about like, uh, he, like th- there's no such thing as, uh, basically he said all energy and resources are infinite. The only thing that, uh, the only limitation is human ingenuity. Um, there's one in there from Drew Armstrong about entropy, but I took obviously this different tack. I said, okay, what, what does this mean for kind of the human spirit or, you know, the, 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 you know, this is what, this is, this is where people misunderstand Nietzsche. Like his idea of the will to power 
and you know I love Jimmy's song, but he gets this completely wrong. You know, he always talks about, oh, you know, the world is evil, you know, because of our desire for the will to power. No, no, no. Will to power is another word for like spirit or animating force of the human. And when we try and neglect that or downplay it or uh, diminish it in any way, what we do is we lose touch with the very excellence that makes life possible, the very excellence that pushes the bounds and continues life expanding and growing. And I mean, that's, you know, in our neglect of that, we are producing nihilism, emptiness, equality, grayness, basically on the planet. Like we, we getting, we, yeah, the, the leaders are Klaus Schwab and Gavin Newsom instead of, you know, Napoleon and Alexander the Great, very different quality. Alex, it's a, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on to our show, and uh, I hope to continue this conversation, uh, both recorded and unrecorded, so we can be really contrarian uh, in a not too far future. You know we will. Um, can I show some people some things to check out? Yeah. Absolutely. We were just going to ask you. I mean, uh, Luke is the one to ask that. So where where can we direct our listeners to find more uh, more Ale- Alexander the Great stuff? Okay. <laughs> All right. So first thing is is an ask. Is anyone who's interested in the AI stuff, um, I would love them to go and check out spiritofsatoshi.ai. And what we're essentially looking for, and you know, a big part of this is it's a, it's a community project. So we need as many Bitcoiners as possible to help us train the model. And when I say train the model, like it's it's really a bunch of like putting your proof, putting your knowledge to work. So it's kind of like proof of knowledge. You get paid sats for uh, basically answering questions as if you were the model um, and validating whether questions that other people have answered are good or bad, right? And, you know, in doing so, so there's like validation tasks and there's content creation or curation tasks. Um, you participate in those and you basically earn sats. So it's a little bit more uh, profitable than yelling at people on Twitter, um, you know, depending on, you know, what you sort of uh, want to spend your time doing. So that's number one. Then number two is if you had interest in what we discussed with the Bitcoin Times. So as I said, this year's edition, uh, life la- like last year was the Austrian with uh, with Safedean and Pierre and Goldstein and Rahim and all that. And it was like we did the big launch last year, but I think this year's one follows on with energy. And I don't know, I'm, I'm. I know every year I say I'm most proud of this one. So it's, it's really hard to say whether I'm more proud of this one than the last one, but like this one definitely is special. And if anyone ever read the, the remnant piece that I did like two years ago that, you know, ruffled a bunch of feathers. I did. Yeah, thank you. Same. Yeah. Um, this, this Nietzsche piece, I think does a similar sort of job to like really pushing people's, um, notions or conceptions. I know, can you picked up something in the, Thing which might be worth like mentioning here yeah it was the uh, how absolute power corrupts absolutely and how that's only true if the money is not sound somehow because it's not absolute power it's not power itself that corrupts it's the corrupt money that corrupts so, so uh, that allows corrupt people to get into positions of power with somewhere Yes. Yeah. So power. Only, yeah, that's right. So where, where did I say it's not power itself, but those who wield it. It's not that power corrupts, but that the corrupt can attain power, and that exactly. this is like a I love that. paradigm shift that people need to make uh, in their heads. So yeah, if people want to read that, uh, BitcoinTimes.io, and I will. Um, I've actually fuck it. I'll give you guys a code. Uh, if you use the code Energy, you'll save forty thousand sets, which is about ten percent off the. Um, of the publication. All right, wonderful. Uh, one last question: When are you going to write the fascist case for Bitcoin? Uh, I wrote it just under a different name. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Great having you on, Alex. Uh, Thank you, guys. Take care. Have a nice rest of oh the rest of your life. Yeah, thank you, sir. <laughs> that's <laughs> I mean, that's I mean, scary uh, because you're about to say the rest of the day. <laughs> I feel like there's going to be a drone coming to bomb me now. No, but it's. Did you ever thought of that? That uh, have a nice evening is pretty evil. Like, why don't would you want me to have a good time for the rest of my life as well? Like, why why limit yourself to nice evening or nice weekend? 
I mean, appreciate. Yeah, okay, that's cool. Um, I mean, the way it came out no, of your no mouth was like, purpose. "Have a have a nice evening." I mean, I mean, I mean, rest of your life. <laughs> no, I really think we're All gonna right. get killed. Uh, getting tired in the brain here. Yes, exactly. Knut's getting tired. So, thank you again for coming on, Alex. This has been the Freedom Footprint Show. Thanks for listening.